our guest, as you were told in several ways, is uh, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Adam King, uh, who is a research, uh, uh, research associate professor at the South Carolina Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology. This is a separate section from the anthropology department at the university. This is a research institute. Um, and uh, he's been working there for a number of years and has been concentrating on the Mississippian period, particularly uh, that uh, in and around the Etowah Valley, Etowah site particularly, and also the upper Savannah River, uh, Hollywood site and some others in that area. But he's been um, working on this for a number of years and has done some incredible work on, on the Etowah site, uh, first with multiple uh, methods of ground, uh, not ground disturbing, but um, electronic technology to look to see what's under the ground. And he's mapped the site pretty extensively. And then some years ago, we got permission to do a series, I think it was like 50 or so, one by ones to, to spot check some of the findings from the ground penetrating radar. And I think that's what he's going to talk about mostly tonight. But he has been interested in the um, theological or uh, social and, and uh, religious aspects of the people who lived at Etowah at different time periods. There seem to have been about three different time periods of occupation there. And he's also uh, trying to discover what sorts of buildings were there. Uh, we, we know of round buildings and square buildings. There's a whole bunch of other odd shaped ones that he'll probably talk about too. But that's the kind of thing he's working. He's interested in, in, in the people and their, in their relationship with the, with the area uh, and each other. And I probably have rambled way too much. So <laughs> may I turn it over now to our guest speaker, Dr. Adam King of the University of South Carolina. All right, Adam, so I unshared it. If you want to share your screen. Right, and if people have any questions, uh, if you're not the speaker, please mute yourself. Uh, if you have questions, please use the chat box and I will be reading the chat questions at the end uh, so that Dr. King can uh, uh, address the questions. All right, does that look right? Understanding Etowah's communities. All right. <clears throat> well, I, I appreciate the, the invitation to, to come talk. I think I said this to Bill that every time I do a talk, it forces me to think about this stuff and sometimes think about it in a different way. And I come up with things that I hadn't thought of before. Um, and so it's, it's kind of helpful and, and fun to do this. Now, what, what I advertised I was going to do is talk about the communities at Etowah. And what I'm trying to get at is more than, you know, as archaeologists, we deal with the physical remains of past behavior. So we're dealing with stuff. Um, and we all know that going from stuff to people has its pitfalls and its challenges, but it's what's interesting and it's what we're really supposed to be about, right? Um, and so what I wanted to try to get at was, you know, we think about these, the, the place is a town, but it's a community. It's a collection of people. And that collection of people, they're not all related. They don't all like each other. They don't all agree, but somehow they're still all part of the same thing. And it's because they see themselves as from a particular place that has its place in the larger world and it has its own sort of identity and things that go with it. And I, I said in the, uh, the abstract I sent, Chicago is the city of the big shoulders, right? Uh, it's a blue collar place, hardworking, and that's part of the identity of the people that are there. Um, and so, you know, some of that you can think of as marketing, but even in these kinds of communities, they're bringing people in, people are being drawn in and, and exactly what's going on there and what they say about the place is part of what attracts people to the place. And the other thing about communities is that they, they can change their identity or, or what, they, what they think they're about. Um, and so was Helen, Georgia always a little Bavarian town? Um, it at some point changed what it was for a specific purpose. And so what I wanted to try to do, I'm gonna use uh, archeology, span some architecture. I'm gonna use a little bit about imagery. I'm gonna use some stuff about belief systems to try to get at what I think is going on at the Etowah communities and what the, those communities are 
about. Um, and this is, is just a really nice artist reconstruction of Etowa, um, but it's Etowa at its peak. <laughs> and this is not what Etowa always looked like. It was occupied for 550 years and it grew and it changed over time. And so I want to do a couple of things before I get into the communities. Um, I want to show a little bit about the site and then I want to talk a little bit about its history. Uh, you know, some of you have been there, some of you maybe haven't been there, some haven't been in a while, and some people like me like to look at pictures of cool places regardless of whether you've been there in a while or not. So um, here is just a, it's kind of old at this point, but an aerial of Etowah. Anybody who's been to Etowah recently will recognize that there's trees on Mound A and there are no longer trees on Mound A, but it captures sort of the setting next to the river and those big mounds. Um, now here's a side-by-side -side comparison between, this is a drone shot from a few years ago that Chet Walker did of the site itself. And then we've got the, the site features next to it. And so those main features are mounds A, B, and C, earthen platform mounds that were built in stages over time. A is about 65 feet tall, B about 20, and C was about 18. And then you also see D, E, and F are three smaller mounds. And then the entire site at one point was enclosed within a ditch and a wall, and that ditch connected a series of borrow pits, which were the source of fill to build the mound. But again, that's sort of the maximum of what was made at the site, but it wasn't all put together at the same time. And what's there and how people used it is part of what tells us a little bit about what was going on at the site and what people thought about the site. So here's just a, a few images. I, I like this image of Mound A. It's the treeless Mound A. It's one of the biggest, but certainly not the biggest pile of dirt in North America, but it's a big one and it's got a big ramp projecting off the eastern side. It's got a terrace on the southern side, about an acre on top. So it's a big mound and it was built, probably started around as early as maybe 1000 or 1150 AD and was probably completed around 1350. So there's a couple hundred years of periodic building represented in there. And you see Mound B tucked off to the side. There's a, an image of Mound B, it's a smaller mound um, Mound A, we don't know a ton about because nobody's really excavated much. I did a little bit at the top and the foot of the mound in preparation for some visitor access stairs. The same is the case for Mound B. Uh, a couple of big holes were sunk into the middle of the mound in the 1880s and the 1920s, which we didn't learn from a lot. Um, A.R. Kelly dug on the west side. I dug a little bit here on the north side. <clears throat> but it, the best we can understand, it was probably constructed between 1100 and 1350 also. And then we've got Mound C. Mound C is tucked in the back corner behind Mound A. It was the site's burial mound. It was completely excavated and reconstructed. And it's reconstructed at a smaller version than the original size of the mound when it was finished because the state of Georgia was trying to save a little bit of money on mound fill. Um, but this is the, the mound that had all of the really incredible stuff buried in it that you see in the museum. Copper plates, shell gorgets, pottery vessels, stone blades. This is actually a two-dimensional map of all of the features that was part of that three-dimensional mound. All of the gray things are burial pits and the linear things are walls that were built around different stages of the mound. There were about 350 people buried in the mound between uh, relatively quickly, probably between 1275 and 1350. It's a relatively short period of time. Um, it's important to acknowledge that the people who built this place were the ancestors of the Muscogee people today or the Creek people today. And they maintain a strong interest in this place um, and they think about Georgia as the homeland, and they are especially sensitive about the treatment of human remains and the treatment of the sacred objects that were buried with them. And so most of the stuff that came out of Mound C falls into that category, and it's important stuff to them, and they're very sensitive about what's done with it. We won't do much with it tonight. Um, if you go on top of Mound A, you can look out um, to the east, and you can see these smushed down little bumps that are mounds D, E, and F. They were built in the 16th century, 
and they've been plowed from probably the, the early 19th century through, I think, to the 1970s. So they've been kind of squished down and spread out, but they're, they're still out there. Um, and then we have the Palisade Ditch. So there are a series of borrow pits that were used as sources of fill for the mounds. At some point, probably around 1350, those were connected, creating a ditch, and then a big wall was put on the inside of it. Um, and what you see here is one of the wider pieces of that Palisade Ditch right in front of the Etowah Museum. And of course, the fish weir, which is always a popular thing for people to see made out of rock in the Etowah River. And the idea was it was designed to funnel fish down to a trap to harvest fish. Um, the story that was passed to me was that we don't know how much of this is actually original because it had been reconstructed periodically um, throughout the course of the history of the site as a park. It probably is an original piece of the park but it's probably been reconstructed. Um, so those are, the, those are the pieces of the site. Now, like I said, they didn't all get built at the same time. So another thing I wanna do is just kind of run quickly through the history of the place. Um, and it emphasizes something Jack brought up in the introduction. The site was occupied for 550 years, give or take, but it wasn't continuously occupied. It was occupied, people left, people came back, people left, people came back, and then people left. So in a sense, what we have is not one community, but three communities that were established. And each of those communities was sort of newly established, it drew people in. And so again, that, that identity or what it's all about was part of what brought people to it. So as early as 1000 AD, maybe a little bit later, Etowa is established. It's not a town before that. There really isn't much evidence of occupation on this spot before this early Mississippian. And at that time, there's nothing else like it in the Etowah River Valley. And one of the unique features is it looks like we have some indirect evidence that the biggest mound, Mound A, construction had started on that mound. And again, throughout the rest of northern Georgia, building platform mounds wasn't a thing before this time. So this is something new and unique about Etowah. You go forward 100 years and the st stages are added to Mound B. So they've got two mounds and then a few other mound sites appear in the Etowah River Valley. So things start to grow and expand a little bit. But then something interesting happens. As far as we can tell, Etowah doesn't seem to be occupied and we don't see much evidence for occupation in the Etowah River Valley. And so for a couple of generations, not particularly long, people seem to be gone. And I don't have a really good explanation. And there's a, there's a whole research project that could be done around this. But so that first community is there, expands a little bit and then is gone. And then by 1250, a new community is established. People come back. Um, but when people come back, the place really blows up. You can see in the lower map that there's now five other small single mound sites that appear around Etowah. And during this early Wilbanks phase, most of the enormous Mound A was built, most of Mound B was built, and probably half of Mound C was built. So they're building a lot of mounds. There's this big buildup and this big um, influx of people back to this area. And by 1325, 1350, you've got a wall around the site, you've got a formal plaza in front of Mound A, and Etowah is probably the center, the biggest place in Northern Georgia, East Tennessee, Northeast Alabama, and dominates at some level, politically and socially, a large area. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a, it's a place, it's abandoned, and then when people come back, boom, it blows up and it becomes something really big and powerful. And then it seems to be abandoned again. We've got the Palisade wall is burned, houses in the community are burned, and there's evidence that the mortuary temple on top of Mount C was destroyed. So it looks like the place is sacked and people leave again. And at least the lower part of the river valley, there don't seem to be a lot of people around. And so that second community really fluoresces and then comes apart. This time it may have been pushed apart. And then people probably don't return until 1475. So it's four or five generations of people not being there, people return to Etowah. 
and they build mounds D, E, and F. They use mound B, but as far as we can tell, they didn't do anything with A or C. And the focus of the village is sort of between A and D, E, and F. It's a much smaller place. It's not the big place it once was. It's an important place in the Etowah River Valley, but it's incorporated into the gigantic polity that DeSoto described as Kusa. And the capital of Kusa was the Little Egypt site up on the Kusawadi River. So by the time people came back to Etowah for the third iteration of the communities, it was a place on the landscape. It wasn't a huge place when DeSoto was there for 10 days and he said, this is where we were, but he doesn't mention big mounds. He doesn't mention big important people. And so you get the sense it's a place on the landscape. So we get this, you know, community disappear, community attacked, another community. And then this final community probably falls apart after European contact probably in the 1550s or 1560s, Marvin Smith has done a nice job of summarizing how what looks like European diseases cause population loss and coalescence, and people basically move down the Coosa River into Alabama that eventually become part of the Creek Confederacy. So Etowah has this sort of segmented history. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about really is the first part of that history, earliest Etowah, and that first community. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to drop off the edge of the map a little bit because I'm going to talk about things that we don't necessarily always talk about in terms of archaeology. I'm going to try to get into beliefs and themes and symbolism and those sorts of things. Um, and again, this is Etowah at its maximum, but keep in mind that early on Etowah was smaller, that first version I'm going to talk about. Now, when I finished my dissertation, I hadn't really done much excavation at Etowah. I just summarized what other people did, and I was looking to figure out what to do next. And we were involving the Muscogee Nation as part of what we were doing because we knew it was the right thing to do and they were interested, but we also knew they weren't thrilled with us necessarily digging. So we decided to do um, non-destructive kinds of work, remote sensing or geophysical prospecting. And the guy in the middle in white there is Chet Walker, who has his own geophysical prospecting company. Chet is really the driver behind most of the work that we did. We use three different techniques. On the bottom left is uh, electrical resistivity. Drive two probes in the ground, shoot a current between it, and the current is resisted depending on the density, texture, moisture of the soil, and if there are things buried underneath. And so you get ones and zeros that you can map out. The one in the middle does the same thing. That's a gradiometer or a magnetometer, except it measures slight variations in magnetism on that spot. So again, soil variation, dig a hole, fill it back in, burn something, bury a rock, and it's going to show up as a subtle magnetic variation that you can map out. The one on the far right is ground penetrating radar. The one probably a lot of people are most familiar with, it shoots an electromagnetic wave down into the soil profile. It's reflected back up and the, the speed at which it comes back and the time it takes tell you about the nature of the soil and again can reveal things that are buried under there. We had the most success with the magnetometer. When we were doing the resistivity work it was so dry that there wasn't enough contrast between the soils to get much out of it. The ground penetrating radar produces the most complex data set that in some cases can be challenging to interpret by itself, but the magnetometer was great. It produced beautiful results. And here we have on the left, again, that aerial of Etowah. And on the right, we have the area that Chet Walker has surveyed with a magnetometer. So all of Etowah, uh, downriver a little bit to the sod farm, upriver to part of the pasture between the site and the Arrowhead Park. And I'll show you a close-up of it, but the thing is, the dark spots are high magnetism, the light spots are low magnetism, and even from this distance, you can see there's a bunch of stuff there. If we, this is just blowing up a piece of it. In the lower left, you see the very edge of Mound A, you see that one path that goes from the museum to Mound B, and then if you go to the right, you see the, the farm road, um, and what you see are all sorts of dark things, but I know you can make out <laughs> squares, and rectangles and linear things. Um, and all of those are features 
that are revealed by the magnetometer. And this is what Chet Walker used for his dissertation. And one of the things that we noticed in all of this, um, because Chet worked with it systematically, is that in the things that look like buildings, there's two different kinds of magnetic signatures. Call them anomalies, because that's what we call them. Type one anomalies are sort of a shotgun blast of highs and lows. And actually, if you look at that, you can see a nice square in there with some highs and lows. The one on the right um, is just a nice outline of a high with a high spot in the middle. We looked at those and thought that looks like the two different architectural forms that were built at Etowa. The type one looks like single set post buildings. The posts are set individually in their own hole and then saplings and cane are woven between and it's packed with red clay and daubed up and then you got a thatch roof. When those things burn or when they fall down, that red clay falls down in blobs. The red clay is red because there's iron in it. Iron is more magnetic. And if you burn it, it's even more magnetic. And so the highs and lows are the collapsed daub walls and the daub around the roof and things like that. So that looks like, and those are probably built between 1250 and 1550. The one on the right, the type two, looks like a wall trench building. Wall trench buildings, you dig a trench, you prefab a wall segment out of small saplings and you stick it in the trench and you do that four times and tie it off at the top and you have a building. They're not daubed um, and they just have a hearth in the middle, no interior supports. And that's what the, the magnetometer thing on the right looks like, just an outline with a dot in the center. So we thought if we could confirm this, we could map out the distribution of houses at Etowah dating to different time periods without having to dig the whole site, which nobody would ever let us do. And I would never live long enough to be able to do. So in 2013, I took a field school of uh, people from Texas State and from the University of South Carolina. We also had people from the Muscogee Creek Nation Cultural Preservation Office who dug with us for two weeks. And we set out to test, as Jack mentioned, test a bunch of these anomalies and especially to evaluate the idea that type one anomalies are single set post buildings, type two anomalies are wall trench buildings. And here's our a list of folks from the Muscogee Nation that came out and worked with us. And that was cool for the students, cool for the folks from the Muscogee Nation. It was a great experience for all of us. Um, here is a map that shows the location of the anomalies that we tested. And so we used the big gradiometer map, identified uh, houses that we wanted to test that, that looked like the different anomalies. And then I actually had Chet Walker come back and he collected these again at 25 centimeter intervals. So we had really detailed information. And then we put down one by ones with the idea that we would hit the wall and see whether it's a wall trench or whether it's a single set post building. And I picked 10 type one anomalies and 10 type two anomalies. Here's just an example of the type one anomaly. You can see the magnetometer on the right and where our test unit was. And on the left, you can see it's a collapsed daub wall with single set posts. Nine out of the 10 things that I identified as type one anomalies turned out to be single set post buildings. So that looks like a nice correspondence. Here's our type two, and again, the mag on the right and the archeology span on the left, and you can see the same thing. We thought that would be a wall trench building, and that's exactly what it was. And eight out of the 10 anomalies that we thought were wall trench buildings turned out to be. So because of the testing, I feel pretty good in saying, yeah, type two anomaly is a house that dates from 1000 to 1200, and type one anomalies, it's a house that dates from 1250 to 1550. And so that allows us to map out the distribution of these and get a sense of the organization of the communities. Um, and I'm going to focus on the type two anomalies and what you see from 1000 to 1200 and Etowah's first community. So that was a major piece of information that we had in terms of trying to understand that community. Um, what else I'm going to go to is things that we've learned from the historic narratives, the sacred narratives of indigenous people of the Southeast, stuff that's been recorded from the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s. And it's a living belief practice that people still believe and live today. 
So this is really Kent Riley, George Langford, Jim Brown, some people who've been working with this stuff forever, I've been a part of as well, trying to reconstruct how during the Mississippian period, they envisioned the cosmos. How was the world put together? And this idea of a layered cosmos is something that spread across the Eastern seaboard and lots of different people think about the cosmos in that way. It's three realms, there may be layers within the realms, but you've got this world, it's a flat plane floating on the primordial sea. It's the place of people and animals and plants and some spirits. And it's positioned directly between a sky realm above where the, the sun is a major deity in the sky. It's a keeper of moral order, the bringer of life, that sort of stuff. And then an underwater or under the ground world that's beneath everything, that's the place where the dead go, but it's also the place where water comes from and it's the place where life is renewed from. And then you've got connecting all three of those realms, an axis or a connection. It's a tree, it's a pole, it's a column of smoke, but things can travel between the realms, spirits, souls, prayers, medicine, power, um, up and down this axis, and it runs through the center of all the realms. So there's our idea of the cosmos. And when we look at continuing Native American practice, and again, practice that we've, that anthropology and history has recorded for a couple of centuries, we can look at the green corn ceremony. A lot of indigenous communities here in the Southeast have multiple ceremonies every year in a ceremonial round. And one of the most important is the green corn ceremony that's been described many times. It's a midsummer first fruits kind of a thing. All of the ceremonies happen in a ceremonial ground that you see in this image here. There's a fire in the center, often it's on top of a little mound, and there are logs placed at the four cardinal directions with a fire in the middle. Then there's an open space. And then there are a series of, they call them sheds or arbors that are benches with a cover over it where the people participating in the ceremony sit. And then most of these ceremonial grounds have something encircling the whole thing. It can be a ring of shells, it can be a ring of dirt, but that defines the edge of the ceremonial ground. When that sacred fire is kindled, that ceremonial ground is activated. And when you're in that space, what you do there affects the rest of the world and it's connected in that central axis to the other realm. So it's a, a sacred space. What happens in the green corn is that the, the world is renewed. It's a renewal kind of a thing. Um, people get rid of their old stuff. They throw it out and the sacred fire is extinguished. Everybody's fire is extinguished and a new sacred fire is born. That sacred fire is conceived of as a living thing that goes through a life cycle. It's born at green corn, it ages through the fall and winter, and then it basically dies or is retired at green corn and a new one is born. And that sort of mirrors the, the natural cycle of the world, but also the, the social cycle of the world. People, the community and the world sort of accrues messed up things and impurity as the year goes by. And then during green corn, you sort of re you press start and redo it all. So the world is recreated, society is recreated. In a sense, the creation of the world happens again and we get to start over. And that creation of the world happens when you rekindle that sacred fire. And what happens as part of green corn is before you rekindle the fire, you resurface, the ceremonial ground, you put another little pile on top of the fire mound and all the old stuff you scrape up and put on top of another mound. So this whole idea of mounding and covering and purifying as a part as a part of this. And that periodic purification is something that is a key part of Southeastern indigenous religious practice. Um, and that purifying is done primarily through redoing or remaking or recreating. So we know that's an important theme. And the square ground, you're recreating this earth. You're recreating the earth, the earthly plane where people live. And that sort of remakes the world for everybody. All right, so on the left, we have sort of a, a top-down view 
of the earthly plane or the model of the earthly plane. You've got the sacred center, which is the fire in the middle, and then around it is an open space. And then around that is the realm of people where people live. And if you go far enough, you drop off the edge into the primordial sea. And so you can think of that as a model of this world, which again, you can manipulate this world and purify it by lighting a new fire and by covering things up. All right, so it turns out that the ceremonial ground is based on that same principle, right? You've got the sacred fire with the logs in the center. You've got an open space. You've got the realm of people in the sheds around it. And then you've got the border around it. So the ceremonial ground is a model of the earthly plane. And what they do in the ceremonial ground affects the earthly plane. And one of the things they do is sort of renew it or restart it. So the, the ceremonial ground can be thought of as a model of the earthly plane. Now, at least some languages, the Muscogee languages, the name for the square ground is also known as the big house. And that means that the square ground is the house of the community. So that means that it's possible to think of regular houses in the same way that you think about the square ground. This is a reconstructed waddle and daub house at Etowah. If you look at how these houses are put together, there's a fire in the middle that creates a column of smoke that goes up. There's an open space around it. And then there are the beds where people sleep, the, the realm of people, and then there's a wall that ends it. And so the house floor and the house itself is another version of a model of this world in the cosmos. It's the family's version of their space in this world. And there's some indication that this is not just anthropologists making this up, that this is the way indigenous people thought about their, their place in their house. So we've got the square ground is this, we have the house is this. And then if you look at Mississippian communities, you see where I'm going with this. It's the same idea. You've got an open space. Instead of the sacred fire, you've got a pole in the middle, open space, the realm of people, and then the edge of the community. And after that, you drop off. And so community layout is again modeled on their understanding of how the earthly plane works. And so that means that when you build a community, you're building your community's place on the earthly plane. You're putting yourself in a place. All right, mounds, platform mounds. We know linguistically that for some Southeastern indigenous people, the name for a platform mound is the same as the name for the earth. And so it's been argued that mounds are really earth symbols. It is another model of the earth. And putting a layer of soil over the top of the earth is a way of renewing the earth. And so by manipulating mounds, you're manipulating and renewing the earth. So you can think about mounds and mound building as another piece of the same thing. It's a model of the earthly plane and people are doing things to it. And one of the things you can do to it is cover it over and renew it. So we have this theme that runs through a bunch of different pieces of Mississippian material culture generally. And it all can be connected back at least in part, there's multiple pieces to it, but at least in part to this idea of creating the earth and putting you in it. All right, that, that slide was supposed to be for that. You can go from houses to um, communities to mounds, and they all, at least in part, are emplacing and um, sort of modifying your place in the cosmos. All right, so. That brings us to earliest Etowah. Before Etowah was established, there wasn't a place there. So people came to that place and they came for a reason. And the interesting thing is there's a, a student at UC Santa Barbara named Matt Lobiondo, who has been working with me on the earliest pottery at Etowah and looking at decoration and temper and other things, he's identified that there are two different pottery traditions that coexisted at earliest Etowah. One of them developed out of 
the late woodland woodstock phase in northern Georgia, and the other developed out of late woodland early Mississippian phases in eastern Tennessee. So Etowa was established as this new Mississippian place, like no other in northern Georgia, from people from different places. So not only did it draw people in, but it drew people, different people in. So there's this, sort of this multicultural aspect to it. Um, and again, here's, here's early Etowa phase. Etowa, um, one of the keys is that they begin mound building and you already see where the mound building fits into this. But before this, there weren't any platform mounds in Northern Georgia. This is the first Mississippian one. So this is a new thing that's happening at this new community. And remember what I showed you with the type two anomalies. What we see are a series of little neighborhoods or subcommunities in the distribution of these buildings. And that kind of fits nicely. We, we really need to evaluate it with some more archeology, span but it fits nicely with the idea that we have people from different places coming to Etowa. And the interesting thing is they're coming to Etowa, but they seem to be building and maintaining their own unique space within the larger place of Etowa. Not only that, but they seem to be maintaining aspects of their own unique pottery traditions at the same time. So people are drawn to the place and they're doing things that, that make them part of the place, but they're also keeping some of their uniqueness. So we've got these little sub-communities. Not only do we have the little sub-communities, but again, we have the initial stages of Mound A being built. And in the same vicinity, we have a series of borrow pits that were probably for the fill for Mound A, and they're filled with feasting materials, which means that people were getting together. These people from these different neighborhoods were coming together. They were building the mound and they were feasting. And feasting is one of those ways that you integrate people and get them to work together. Um, to the, to the um, west, you see that little purple square that says integrative space. That's a series of big buildings. Let me see if my next slide, no. That's a series of big buildings that were designed to draw people together. And so you can already see you got disparate groups coming together. They got their own pottery traditions, their own sort of neighborhoods, but then they're doing collective stuff in the middle, building mounds and other stuff. So if we go to residential architecture, all right, now one of the unique things about earliest Etowah is they're building these wall trench buildings. That is not something that was around necessarily in Eastern Tennessee, Northeast Alabama, or Northern Georgia during the late woodland period. It's an entirely new architectural form that people start using when they establish Etowa as this new community. So part of what's new about this place is a new way of building buildings. But as we've already talked about, those buildings are or can be viewed as a model of this world in the cosmos. So when a family built a house, what were they building? They were building their place in the cosmos, in this new community with this new kind of architecture. And when we look at the neighborhoods, what do we see? We see a collection of these new houses organized around an open space. And these neighborhoods, in a sense, were another model of the earth. So these different ethnic groups that were coming together, not only the families were building their place, but that group was building its place on the earthly realm within the larger Etowah. So the families are building a place, the sub-community is building a place, and they're doing it here in this new place, Etowah. And <laughs> At the same time this is going on, we have the integrative stuff that's going on around Mound A and the feasting and the big buildings. So individual um, families together in these different ethnic collectives, and then they're being drawn together for things like some sorts of communal activities. Here are a couple of big buildings that were in that purple area. Structure three was 12 meters long, had a powdered red ochre floor and a platform in the middle of it. Definitely a big building, but also an elaborate building, probably designed for something special. And then structure five was almost 100 feet long, 30 meters long. So this is a big building designed for collective activities that would have been great for drawing all these different people together and doing something in common. 
And part of what they're doing in common is in that same area, they're building a mound and then they're, they're feasting and doing things at the same time. And building a mound is creating the earth and recreating the earth. So we've got people building their place and then we've got everybody coming together to create the earth in a new way. Just in case you think it only goes there, we can look at the pottery tradition. I said that we see um, stuff from Eastern Tennessee and Northwestern Georgia in the pottery tradition that's primarily in the temper choices. But when it comes to the decorations, there's a whole new set of decorations that we don't see in earlier time periods. And regardless of which pottery recipe you use, everybody's using the same motifs. So it's kind of like the building type. We're all coming from different places. We've maintained some of our distinctiveness, but we're all going to do the same things that are connected to this new place. And you might notice something about those motifs. They all model the same idea of the earthly plane and the sacred center. So what they're impressing onto the pots is that image of the earthly plane. And what they're doing is they're building coil pots and then they're putting a hand or a pottery trowel on the inside and they're taking a carved wooden paddle with a design, smushing it up to form the pot. And when they do that, they're impressing these models of the earthly plane. And if you think about making a model of the earthly plane is the same as making the earth, then sort of symbolically, it's all connected to the same stuff. Now, who's making pottery? Well, at least historically, we know women were the potters. And we at least assume that that's probably the case in the Mississippian period. But women weren't just the creators of pottery. Women were and continue to be in this belief tradition creators in general. They bring forth life. They grow gardens. They create the next generation. They are the fundamental creative force in the universe. Um, and not only do they create life, but they created this world in the cosmos. Before there was an earthly plane, there was just sea and sky. And there are lots of different narratives from different groups that talk about how the earthly plane was created. And they all involve some sort of an earth diver that dives to the bottom of the primordial sea, brings up earth and creates the earthly plane. Invariably, whether it's water beetle or crayfish or anybody else, they're female. The earth is gendered female, the creative force is gendered female, and women create, and they created the earth. Um, if you think about making pottery, it is analogous to creating the earth. You go to water, you dig earth out of it, you dig the clay out of it, you form it into something, um, and then you end up impressing the imagery of the earthly plane on it. And so what's happening potentially with women is they're recreating the earth with these images that represent this new place, Etowa, every time they make a pot or use a pot and those sorts of things. So we have this running theme of creating and emplacing. And that makes sense given what we're talking about is an entirely new community that's drawing people together from different places. Some of it is new material traditions that everybody's buying into, the house form, the pottery decorations. Some of it enables those different groups to have some of their own uniqueness, the pottery recipe, their own neighborhoods, but ultimately, and they're creating their own unique spaces at Etowa, but what are they really doing at Etowa? They're remaking the world. They're remaking the world where all of these different groups are there together. And so in a real sense, what's going on at earliest Etowa is people that are drawn there to remake the world in a new way. And the question is, why in the world are they doing that? And, you know, just a, just a charismatic leader could inspire things like this. But there's an argument out there. What we see in the Woodstock phase in the late Woodland period in northern Georgia is towns are palisaded and towns are located in defensible positions. So the implication is people are fighting a lot. If you're fighting a lot, then it's dangerous for women to go to the gardens. It's dangerous for men to go hunting. It's dangerous to go collect firewood and get water. 
Um, and so this potentially could have been a way to sort of get everybody to work together in a sense, a mutual non-aggression pact. And they did it by remaking the world in a new way with new traditions to sort of get rid of that old way with so much competition and fighting. Whatever the inspiration for it, that seems to be what earliest Etowah is all about. It's the place where the world is made anew and we have our, we make our place in it. And that's what draws people to it. And that's what binds all these different people together in this idea of this new community. Now, the interesting thing is by 1200, the people, they seem to leave. So whatever was going on there didn't, didn't take or didn't stick or something happened to drive everybody away. And it lasts a couple of generations, as I said. And then, as I said too, by 1250, people return with a vengeance and everything builds up, the place blows up. It's a new community. New people are attracted to it. And we can again see it's probably local people from Northern Georgia and Eastern Tennessee but we also see now buried in Mound C, embossed copper, um, shell gorgets, pottery vessels that are coming from as far away as the Mississippi River Valley and the Nashville Basin. And so now people are coming from far away as well as the local and an, an entirely new kind of community is created that really takes off and becomes an important influential one in this region. Um, <clears throat> and I was going to continue and go through the middle Mississippian version of the communities too, but then I realized I was probably talking too long. And plus I told Manny that I wouldn't take the 50 bucks because I really wanted to come up there and have dinner. And so I'm going to leave you with an archaeological cliffhanger. If you want to hear how the middle Mississippian community works, then you've got to invite me back. And you have to invite me back when I can come up and sit and have dinner and talk to everybody. Um, it draws on some of the same themes, but they put it together differently and there's a different purpose in mind. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and I'll be glad to answer questions. Thanks, Adam. That was a very, very good talk. Very informative. And um, I, I just love talking about sites on the Etowah because, as you know, I have the site right up upriver from you. Yeah. Um, that's that's a, a cool area. Very cool area. Uh, we do have one question and only one question. If anybody else has questions, please type the uh, click on that chat box and go ahead and uh, 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 type your message in there. Uh, one person wrote, is Georgia an ideal environment to dig? To dig? No, it's too damn hot. Um, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's <coughs> when, when you get into, you know, the Etowa River Valley is nice because as anybody who's dug there knows, you go down through the topsoil and you got red clay. Yeah. And you know when you hit subsoil and the features <coughs> just jump out at you because they're such a different color and different texture. I've worked in the, the coastal plain of South Carolina and Georgia where it's sandy soil and it's harder to see the features and the organics from the features leach out and they disappear. So I would say it's a great place to do archaeology. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's ideal, but that's sort of a personal. I, you know, I, I love I love this area of the world and this is where I always want to work. Um, even if it's hot uh, in the summer. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but there's a lot of great archaeology there. As Bill will tell you, lots of people will tell you, there's an extraordinary amount of, of really fascinating things that go way back to 12,000 years ago to study. Plenty of opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another question, what's the most rewarding part of your job? The most rewarding part of my job? Um, well, I, I teach students, I mentor grad students, and I get to do archaeology. Um, and each of those has its, has its things that I really enjoy. Um, the doing archaeology, the way, the way we've always done it, it's, it's not easy 
I don't know. It almost seems like it's serving mostly me. Um, so it's fascinating. It's interesting. I figure things out. I publish it. Three people read it um, and life goes on. Uh, so it, it's fun. It's interesting. It's fascinating. You, you share it with the descendant communities and they're interested. And that's, that's pretty rewarding when you can make that connection to them. But in some ways, I feel like the way archaeology is done now and the context it's which, in which it's done, we don't do a great job of taking the cool stuff we learn and then, you know, letting other people share in it. Because let's be honest, academia doesn't reward us for giving public talks. It rewards us for publishing in journals that, again, three people read, that sort of a thing. So I love doing the archaeology and figuring things out. It's rewarding when I find people outside of the discipline that think it's interesting and learn things. I really like teaching students and especially intro level students because I sort of reel them in, not that I want them to be archeologists, but that I expose them to a wider world than the modern material world and help them connect the fact that there were people back then and they had the same problems. They did some of the same things and we can learn from that. So, um, but I, I'm, a, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. I can find rewarding things in most of the stuff I do. It's rewarding to feed my cats, so you know. Thank you. Another question, and we've had a couple questions come in and some of these are excellent questions. Um, how are the gender dynamics you described so nicely uh, reflected in the burials at the site? Are men and women buried in Mound Seed together, for example, or in separate areas? Um, there, well, Mound C, as far as we can tell, they're buried in the same areas. Um, I think there's probably uh, a slight maybe more than a little slight um, preference for males to be buried in Mount C uh, instead of females. But who, the people who seem to be buried in Mount C are um, members of specific family or social groups. So there are men and women and there are children. Um, and in some instances, you can see what seem to be gender differences in terms of what people are buried with uh, for example, the King site, David Hawley wrote a great book on the King site, which is a 16th century site over near Rome. And you can really see diff what look like gender differences. When you get into Mound C, the people buried in Mound C are part of an important segment of society. They were, they seem to be buried with ritual regalia, the equipment and stuff you need to conduct ritual. And men and women seem to be buried with that stuff. It's not just men, it's not just women. And the same things that are sometimes buried with men are buried with women. Um, you know, I, I will say I attend a, a ceremonial ground in Florida and it's, it's truly, truly beaten into our heads as men that we are the inferior form of creation. And all we are trying to do is be worthy of being there with the women because their importance, their power is fundamental. It's the earth, it's creation, it's life, it's renewal. And the men are really there to sort of make things work, but it's really the women that are running the show and are the most important. And that sort of complementarity exists through everything. Men may do the ceremony and the medicine, but they're doing it in service of the women in the community. Um, women, sort of control life forces by bringing forth new children and growing things. Men control life forces by going and killing things and feeding people. And so there are all these different sort of complementarities that are embedded together. Maybe one may seem more important, but they can't work without the other. They really are, you know, two sides of the same coin. Sure. Another question, how do the earliest mounds at Carter's Lake fill into the Etowah chronology? Um, so the, the earliest is Six Toe Field. Um, and it, as far as we can tell, and it hasn't been dated particularly well, but as far as we can tell, it may start, you know, a few generations or even a century after Etowah gets going. But that's just based on what we think we know now. And what's going on at Six Toe Field has some interesting similarities to what's going on at Etowah. They have these big 
borrow pit things filled with feasting material, just like at Etowah, associated with mound construction. It just looks like the mound construction is a little bit later. Um, as you go on in time, Six Toe Field is roughly contemporary with earliest Etowah, and then Bell Field is roughly contemporary with that middle occupation when Etowah is at its peak. And then, of course, Little Egypt sort of takes over when Etowah goes down and Little Egypt becomes the dominant center in the region and Etowah becomes semi-nowheresville. Um, so I don't know if that helps. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, can you suggest why the larger prefab wall designs of the early period uh, were replaced by smaller individual buildings? I, I, think, I think we're playing around with ideas of tradition and again, in some sense, who they think they are. Those single set post buildings are local North Georgia traditional buildings. Those wall trench buildings are not. And early on, in earliest Etowah, they're building the wall trench buildings. And then after Etowah disappears and comes back, they're back to building the single set post buildings. And I think that says something about if you think about earliest Etowah as sort of establishing this kind of community with these ideas about creating the world and the ceremonialism that goes with it in mounds and stuff like that, that sort of puts those pieces together. And then when we come back in the middle Mississippi and it's all there, it's embedded within the way people do it. But now they're saying, yeah, no, this is really, you know, this is really a North Georgia thing. So the, the pottery tradition becomes much more like North Georgia. All the other tempering types go away and it's just sand tempered. The single set post buildings come back. So it's almost like they get all these people in here and we're gonna do something new, unique and different. And we're gonna set up this idea. And then by the middle Mississippi and all those ideas are embedded, but we really want to establish that this is our place here in Northern Georgia. And this is how we do things. So I think it's, I think it's using the material stuff to sort of make a statement about history in place. Okay, excellent. Our next question is uh, very, very broadly, think, think way outside the box here, way outside Etowah. Uh, do you have any theories as to why the Egyptians haven't put a stop to excavations in Egypt yet Native American tribes have here in the United States? And what's the difference? Well, I think there's a couple of differences. If you go to Egypt, you have to have an Egyptian scholar that's on your, your grant with you. You don't do it by yourself. And so it's shared. And when you go to Egypt, you hire local people to do the work. So you're bringing money in. And when you go to Egypt, when you dig the stuff up, you leave it there. It does not come home with you. Um, and so they have a lot more control over it and they've made it so their interests are embedded into the research. Native Americans simply haven't had that opportunity. And I think I'm hopeful, maybe before I expire, we will get there with Native Americans, that um, we will get that sort of cooperation and it's a Native American and it's a non-Native scholar and they keep the stuff and the stuff is housed with them and they work with interpreting it but we're, we're sort of in different places. I think everybody would love to be there and I think it's just gonna take time. The other thing is that antiquities in Egypt is big money. Tourism is incredibly important and always developing new places and making more impressive places for people to visit. And this isn't just Egypt. You can go to anywhere in Mesoamerica, probably in Sicily where you were built. Oh, absolutely. Yep. It's, it's tourism mm -hmm. and they want that. And so at a certain level, they want, you know, they, they want Western scholars to come in because let's be honest, we spend more money on that stuff than a lot of these um, smaller countries or these other countries have the money to spend on. We bring money um, and we help them build a tourism base, but at the same time, they've also set it up. So we're helping them build a local indigenous knowledge base and train their own scholars. I mean, it's, it's pretty damn clever as far as I'm concerned, yeah. but I think that's the difference. Mm -hmm. Indigenous communities are still not really sovereign and they're still embedded within mm -hmm. a dominant society and they don't have the same opportunity to do that. Thank you. Yes, and actually to build on what you said in Sicily, 
it's amazing how many archaeo parks these tourist sites happen to be right on the beach you know it's <laughs> it's, it's a weird coincidence you know yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, two more questions for you. Did the work you did with Jim Langford on the proper on the private property just outside the site add anything to the overall interpretation? I know. I know who asked this question. I know you're out there. Um, that's that's a that's a really muddy issue. <laughs> um, so, and uh, he's he's going to make me explain the whole thing now. So we did. And uh, can I go backwards here? Um, yeah. We because I think I have it somewhere in the gradiometer data. Don't look too closely, or you're gonna get nauseous watching this fly by. All right, you see um, the, if you go all the way to the left of the data, there's a big circle. I don't know if I, do mm. I have a pointer? Mm. Oh, you can use your cursor, it should, yeah, there it is. Mm -hmm. am, I, am I doing it? Yep. All right, so that thing right there. Um, that thing is a gigantic signature when we did the, um, ground penetrating radar across it. The thing is like four meters deep. It's a gigantic hole, right? Um, so we went in and we dug a trench um, from the, the south across the southern edge of it. And we saw it just slope way down and we mapped some of it. The next year we came back and this is Jim Langford, Kusawati Foundation. I helped some other folks up. We dug a backhoe trench from east to west across the whole thing. And it goes down, it does, it goes down four meters. It's a gigantic, wow. intentionally created hole. And when you look at it, it's filled in with alluvium. You can, I mean, some, some geomorphologist would have a career out of looking at the flood stages and dating them and the volume and the strength and all sorts of stuff, because it's not filled in intentionally, it's just filled in. When we got to the bottom, we found artifacts, not a lot. And unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of time. When we got to the bottom, we only got to sample a little bit. I was really hoping to find a floor and a floor that would have features on it that we could, mm -hmm. and we never really did, but we never really had the opportunity to, to expose it all. And so um, there's cultural stuff on the floor and it looks like it's probably middle Mississippian. And that's about all we got. We mapped the profiles and we got some materials from the floor and then we had to fill it back in. And we've, we've never gone back. Now, Jim has talked about this being potentially some sort of an earth lodge or mm. some sort of semi-subterranean thing. Um, and I'm, I'm just not sure what it is. If it was some sort of an earth lodge, you would expect a ring of posts around the edge of the thing, right? And we didn't find anything like that. There are no features off the edges that would say there was a wall around it or was roofed or anything, besides the fact that this thing's 40 meters across and four meters deep. So that's a really, really, really big thing to put a roof over. Um, that doesn't, I mean, like a, like a wall and a roof. Does that mean they couldn't have covered it over with something flat or something else? They could have. And unfortunately, we didn't really get to look at the floor well enough to see if there were features, maybe some big posts, right? You could, you could mm -hmm. envision big posts and then a very low sort of sloping roof over it. We, we, didn't, we didn't find anything like that, but we didn't get a great chance to look. Um, and so the best I can say is it's a big hole that people dug intentionally and threw some artifacts in the bottom and then it filled in naturally. Um, it's of a scale that's kind of unprecedented in terms of architecture, in terms of 40 meters across. I mean, the Macon Earth Lodge is 13 meters across. So, you know, this thing is three times as big um, and it's really deep. God, we were, we were down in this thing mapping the profile. We were getting down there with the, this is bad OSHA stuff that I shouldn't talk about. We were mapping it with a we were going down with a, an aluminum ladder. Dave Holly and I are down there. We just finished mapping. We climb out and that profile collapsed and it collapsed and it took that aluminum ladder and bent it at 45 degrees. If I'd been down there, you know, five minutes later, I wouldn't be here talking. Dumb, don't do that. Um, mm -hmm. We did it the wrong way, but it's, but it's a really deep, huge hole. Was it a borrow pit? It's kind of far outside of the mounds to be a borrow pit, but 
Um, and it's got pretty smooth sides. It's not like a whole bunch of, you know, craters that you see with borrow pits. It's got a pretty smooth side. So it's an intentionally created some sort of a bowl. Uh, and did it go through red clay fill that would have been great for, absolutely. They mined out the red clay that would have been perfect for mound fill. So maybe, maybe it was, but it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because it's so far away from the mounds compared to other closer areas that they were already taking the fill from to begin with. It is on a little um, wash or sort of gully when the river floods, there's a, like another little channel of the river that comes in up river from Etowah and runs through the site and runs through that area there and spreads out. So is it some sort of a drainage feature where you know, when the site flooded, they, they dug this so it sort of more quickly drained the site. I mean, if I was going to do that, I'd put it closer to the river. It doesn't make a lot of sense to put it there, but it's right on that little flood chute. So maybe that was the place to do it. But honestly, we didn't see a whole lot of evidence that there was water sitting in there. We would have seen silting up and stuff like that. So the bottom line is, I don't know what the heck it is. I'm not entirely sure it's some form of architecture. I had a, um, a Native American religious leader talking to me about um, artificial caves. Shaman were trained in caves. Caves are entrances to the beneath world, but they also, at least in his understanding of the tradition, they also made um, artificial caves to train and also to conduct ritual. So this could be some sort of a subterranean thing that was created that we've never seen before for that very purpose. And it might be very much like the structure you were showing me, Bill, that doesn't have anything in it or very little mm -hmm. in it because they weren't living in it and cooking yeah. in it, they were doing different kinds of things. The problem is it's so big. I mean, we never even would have known it existed. If you put a shovel test in it, it would have looked like everywhere yeah. else. It's so big, the only way we knew it was there was from the magnetometer and the GPR. And so I know that's not a satisfying answer, but my answer is, I don't know. A follow-up question for you, Adam. Does it line up with anything? Well, it lines up with that flood chute. Um, yeah. But I mean, in terms of the mound orientations or anything like that? I mean, it's, it's, it's round. Um, yeah. Now, one thing I will say, all right, and this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop little hints about the second part of my talk. The middle, Miss, middle Mississippian, there is an east-west axis that runs from the east plaza over Mound A to a buried plaza west of Mound A. So when you're looking at ideas about the cosmos, west is the direction of death and night and things like that. Um, and so it being on the west side might have something to do with it. You know, there might be ideological reasons for why a subterranean something or other is on the west side because the place of death is also the beneath world, right? And so there could be something like that. If you look at, there's a big circular building to the west of Mount B and there's a big circular building to the west of Mount C. And if you go down river a little bit, there was a big circular building to the west of Free Bridge Mound. Now these are regular buildings that are on surfaces, but is there something about big circular structures and the west behind mounds that this taps into? I, I don't know, but it could be. But I, I don't know that it lines up with anything. You know, it's tricky when it's one point, mm -hmm. you can draw a straight yeah. line with anything else. Um, sure, sure, sure. Uh, and just to let you know, Jim Langford wrote that he did not ask that question. Yeah, no, I know who it is. <laughs> I, yeah, we put his name on there. It's, it's Rick. So. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, Ken Akins asked, uh, Etowa has produced artifacts that we believe originated from Cahokia, such as the Rogan plates. With Cahokia recessing at the same time as the Etowa second phase rises, could Etowa have been settled by Cahokians? It's, yes, but it's more complicated than that. Um, and I, I actually, I have a whole paper on this, as I'm sure you can imagine I do. Um, what the, the Rogan plates were probably created around 1150, 1200 AD. They're buried in Mound C, 1250 to 1300. So they're upwards of a century old by the time they get to Etowah. 
and Cahokia is falling apart as early as 1150 or even 1100. And what they can see at Cahokia is people are bailing out. They're leaving and they're going in every direction, but they're going down the Mississippi River back toward the Cairo Lowlands and the Confluence area. Um, and what comes into Etowah with those Rogan plates, which were surely made in the American bottom, but what comes in with those Rogan plates are shell gorgets and pottery vessels that are made around 1250 in the Cairo Lowlands. So what it looks like to me is as Cahokia was falling apart, important families with their ritual regalia left Cahokia, including those Rogan plates. They left Cahokia and they went down the Mississippi River. Again, they went in every direction, but the ones I'm mm -hmm. talking about went down the river and they established themselves at big sites in the Cairo Lowlands. And then at some point made their way eastward and maybe even passed through the Nashville Basin because we've got some Nashville Basin stuff too. And so, you know, they talk about the Cahokian diaspora. You've got this collapse of this enormous, unique place and the important people at it seem to go in a whole bunch of different directions and sort of like what we see in Mesoamerica, they probably established new ruling lines at a whole bunch of places. In a sense, it's a group of important people looking for a new place to be important. Now, why they came all the way to Etowah is an interesting question, but it looks like it's probably not just the things, because these aren't things you go, oh, I got a copper plate, you want it? This is regalia, this is ritual equipment that belongs to individual people, and they have the right to conduct ceremonies because of it. So this is people with ritual equipment that are traveling. And it may be generations between the collapse of Cahokia mm -hmm. and the arrival at Etowah and it's passed through family lines, but somehow they're continuing that diaspora eastward. And we not only see the stuff at Etowah, we see it at the Hollywood Mound, we see it scattered into North Georgia and East Tennessee, we, and we certainly see it in the Nashville Basin. So it's part of some sort of a fracturing and scattering mm -hmm. of ritually important stuff and people with the collapse of Cahokia, but it's not people coming straight out of Cahokia. Thank you. One last question. Do you have any estimates of the population counts for the three phases of Etowah? Did they get their water from the Etowah River or somewhere else? And on one of your maps, can you show where they grew their crops? Well, um, yeah, I don't have good answers for any of those. You know, some, some of the estimates were in the, the tens of thousands at Etowah. Dan Bigman, who some of you know, Dan and I did a paper where we looked at the number of buildings that we can see at Etowah and using some other sites. This is something Dave Holly has done, looking at a house that needs this much space. And so we took the area inside the ditch at Etowah and calculated the amount of space and the number of houses that would be there. And it's like 300 to 600 people is how many people would fit inside of Etowah. Now we haven't tried to redo that when we see the gradiometer data, but the gradiometer data isn't gonna change that necessarily. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm gonna, spoiler alert, in the middle Mississippi and they move everybody out of Etowah. So there aren't many people in there at all and they're living out around. And that's probably where the gardens are. Um, in all likelihood, we, we don't know enough, and this is another cool sort of study to be able to do potentially with soil chemistry and pollen and things like this. We don't know if they're making giant fields or if they're just you know fields of individual, probably family groups around communities that are scattered around the floodplains. The floodplains are the perfect place to do it, right? You got the best soil. We got enough rain to do rainfall agriculture. You got the best soil, it's periodically renewed. It's deep soil, it doesn't wear out fast. So it's in the floodplain of the Etowah River Valley. And when we look at where sites are, they're up and down the floodplain everywhere. And so they could be gardening everywhere. And then the interesting thing becomes the people that are living in Etowah at the center are somehow convincing everybody else to grow a little bit of extra corn and bring mm -hmm. it into the center for them because they're not growing it themselves 
in there. So the water, I assume the water came from the Etowah River. That's the closest source. The ditch never held water as far as we can tell based on, you know, you would again expect an accumulation of certain kinds of silts and stuff if it held water and there's just no evidence that that was the case. So the river's the, river's the most likely closest spot to do that. I don't know if I got them all or not. Oh, all right. let me say the polity of Etowah. So that was just the town of Etowah and Etowah probably was the center of a chiefdom that may have had several thousand people and it may be upwards of 10,000, but I'm not even sure of that. So, you know, up to, up to 10,000 people in the polity and probably 500 people at most inside that town. But if you take account of the scatter of houses all around, it would be a different thing. Most people are scattered around. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, that's it for questions. Uh, if anybody else has questions, uh, you could ask them. Otherwise, what we can do is unmute everybody. Let's see if I can do that. Uh, I think I can unmute all. Ask all to unmute. If you would like to ask a question, go ahead. Unmute yourself. I, think I just like I can to make that. a comment, if I may. Uh, excellent presentation, Adam. Thank you. That's uh, Pat Darrow. Uh, hey, Pat. I've been following your work for years, and that is outstanding. Some of the best work I've seen. Thanks, Pat. Well, I'm I'm building off of stuff that you did up there at the King site and stuff like that, so it makes it easier. <laughs> well, thank you. Good. Could I? Could I welcome Pat to our gathering? Please do. Absolutely. We're very happy to have you, Pat. Glad that you heard about us and, and hope you will join us frequently and often. I've reached the age I'm very happy to be anywhere, but this <laughs> I was particularly happy to be here tonight. This is yes. a, actually good, a very good uh, presentation and good to, good to hear you and good, good to see you guys. Good to see you, Pat. I haven't seen you since... Uh... A conference in uh, North Carolina, so it's good to see you. you're doing well. Uh, Pat, like Pat, okay. Pat, and uh, yeah, it's great to see you. This is Jim Langford. For some reason, I can't change my name up there to give me my real name. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, but it's great to see you, Pat. And and Adam, super job. Thanks. You you not need to talk on the phone. We haven't done that in a while. I talked to Chet Walker today, by the way. I know. He was, he was oh, he already me. told you. That. He said Jim called me, but I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Do you know? Like I haven't talked to Jim in a long time. So <laughs> well, I, I will call you in the next day or so, and, and uh, we'll get caught up on some things. Okay. okay. But great job, super Thanks. job tonight. Thank you for doing this. Oh, I got some new drone footage, by the way, and some new video footage. Uh, and for your information. The Atlanta Braves have given me a little bit of money to do educational programs in schools uh, around in Northwest Georgia. So I've put it to work, that money to work, and got some great new drone footage, some great new video work, and there's some real pros that did uh, all that work. And I'll be glad to share that with you, awesome. uh, Adam, and anybody else too. Who wants to yeah, see I'd love to see it. Sure. I want to say I, I work with Adam uh, there at Etowah Mounds for like six, seven years. Every year, uh, him and his crew were out there, and it was uh, the most exciting time of the year when they were there as well. Um, we we've done a lot of stuff together, and and I, every, uh, most of what I know about archaeology, ology, uh, especially the Mississippi period, uh, comes from Adam, and he was very open to questions. I probably bored him to death sometimes. <laughs> asking questions, but um, he's a great archeologist and um, and a great site there as well that he worked on. I remember the first time I met him, he uh, came uh, uh, to my, I was told that he was going to come to Etowah and I didn't know what Adam looked like or who he was or anything. And he appears in my front yard in the afternoon. He's got a dirty t-shirt and his hair's all messed up and, and uh, he's wearing shorts. And I thought he was a community service worker. And I told him to <laughs> report to the maintenance uh, area that you'll be assigned his duties. And he said, Ken, Ken, Ken. 
<laughs> it's Adam. It's Adam King. I said, oh, God, I felt like a small, small guy. Because, uh, wow. And I, I just didn't, did not picture Adam like that. I always pictured archaeologists as, you know, uh, being Certainly different. not clean. <laughs> he was like he had a probably a five day beard on him too as well but uh that started a lot of good good uh things that happened at Etowa and I, I appreciate what he's he's done and he's made that site uh even more prominent in the world well and I couldn't you know I really appreciate uh, you know the the help some some folks are more welcoming than others but I've always you know, it was always great with you there because you were you were always ready to help and ready. And we made a mess of that shed and, you know, <laughs> driving in and out at God knows what time and leaving things out and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I've, we always appreciated your help. And, and you know, it's all it's always fun when somebody's interested in what you're doing. Right. I mean, you're doing this because you're interested in yeah. but other people that are, too is really cool and you were always a great ambassador for the site um bringing people in and doing interesting stuff and i think that's that's the cool thing about etowah right you can run into somebody from northwest georgia and they're like oh yeah i went there on one of my school trips as a kid and you can always find people because it's been such a great resource for people to engage with some of this it has been yes mm. <clears throat> Are there any more questions? Anybody else wants to ask questions? Leonard, are you waiting to ask? No, I'm enjoying it. Lots of good questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Adam. We really appreciate your efforts here tonight and we will take you up on the invitation. Yes. Uh, as soon as we can get back in, in uh, together again yeah that would be fun i'd love to come up oh anytime that you feel you know like you're passing through our our area please let us know and we'll gather a crowd around you okay <laughs> sure <laughs> well yeah thanks for thanks for having me this was fun it's fun to talk about this like i said it makes me think about it which is always a good thing yeah well you sort of sent us all thinking about it that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> I guess I can stop sharing this, right? Whenever. If Thank I you, Dr. King. Thank you. There we go. Uh, All right. Well, if there's no other questions, I think we're going to get going. We're going to, we'll just log off here. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to Bill. and, and Thank uh, you, everybody. Yes. Thanks, Thanks Adam. This us. was, this was soon, really Adam. wonderful, Adam. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care, all. Hey, Pat. Take care, Pat. Right, yeah, take care, Pat. If I can leave this. Are you going? That's right. Okay. I think we have most everybody now. Yeah, I think uh, most people have left. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to end uh, end the meeting for all. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Take care.